We have the learning objectives for this chapter, which are basically about two different things. The first is uh, in the book, they move the, a lot, some of the details about recipes to this chapter. So if you remember, we learned about prepping and baking recipes in chapter six. And that time it didn't really make sense. And they, they I think, uh, reworked that chapter. And, and here we defined like how to use recipes uh, without workflows. So like if you are not in a whole, whole modeling workflow and well, the chapter is about dimensional reductions. So it will, it will show some uh, features about recipes through dimensional redu reduction. So the first learning objective is to understand how to use uh, recipes on their own. Uh, like without without predictions and, and workflows, then uh, how to use tidy models for dimensional reduction and also uh, to see a couple of different statistical methods uh, for that. Uh, yeah, so. So what is the motivation for dimension reduction? First one is a bit general, but it's basically visualization. So you may just wanna understand the structure of your data, like in, in exploratory data, data, data analysis. So you may do it before, before or like independently from, from any modeling. But I also mean visualization if you need to understand some part of modeling or pre-processing, uh, like many, many visualizations are not, not easy for, for, for higher dimensions. Uh, another motivation is that like some, some models are, they, they just cannot handle uh, too many uh, dimensions. And so one example is like when there are literally more, more features than, than data points for a prediction, then for, for example, for a linear model, it will, it, it will be a complete, a complete overfit. So it, it doesn't make any sense to have more features than, than data points. And then, then, and then another example is relevant when, when these uh, many features are not, are closely related. So, so for, for example, the, the textbook is example is when you have uh, two features with, with like a, correlation of one or a very high value, then, then it, it's, it's called multicollinearity. And then the computational part of the ordinary, ordinary least squares method will fail because there are like an infinite number of possibilities to, to have the same results. And there are many ways to, to mitigate this. So for example, there are, uh, uh, like lasso regression or, 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 or other type of uh, regularization techniques where you put a penalty on the number of features. features. So, so dimensionality reduction is only, only one, one method to, to solve this problem. And there are, there are many other methods. But for this, it's not only uh, relevant that there are many features, but these features should should be related in, in order to meaningfully reduce the number of dimensions. Uh, so, so these are the the main motivations, I think. Uh, yeah, and and the, and it's noted in the book uh, not to confuse 
uh, dimensional entity reduction with, with feature selection. So usually these techniques create new features which incorporate information from the original features. So you won't drop features completely, but rather, rather create new features which combine the information from, from several features. And Federica will, will go into more and more detail about patterns. <laughs> yeah, so, so the next section is like a preparation to, so the, the example that they use in this chapter is uh, categorizing uh, dried bean types. So there, there are images where there are a mixed so so it is just an it is just an illustration but different bean types have different uh, shape and size and like bumpiness and uh, color and yeah so and the task is to try to uh, categorize uh, the beans based on uh, properties that can be relatively easily calculated from, from the images. And in this task, they assume that image segmentation already happens. So like you have the, you have the uh, line around each, each single bean and you can calculate features from that. Uh, so some some example uh, features are the the area which which has to be approximated with with some uh, either a rectangle or uh, either either a rectangle or, uh, around the bean or like you can uh, decide how many points you want to approximate with obviously you you can't uh, like really calculate the, the, the exact area or, or maybe you can you can calculate it by counting the pixels in it. So that, that, that's just one example. The perimeter, uh, the major axis is like the longest line which you can, the longest segment that you can draw within the bean. Uh, the minor axis is perpendicular to that. Uh, Compactness is about how close it is to a circle. Uh, aspect ratio is similar to that. So it's like how much bigger is the major axis than the major, minor axis and so on. So we can, uh, we can imagine a lot of features and some have, so, so some are different. So for example, you can have you can have any 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 area with, with any compactness. So these are not related, but perimeter and 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 area is is correlated because because bigger beans have these both bigger. So like they have a a chart with with the correlation uh, matrix, and I guess you can you can. Uh, Imagine that like there are 15 different uh, features which all describe the shape in some way. And then many are closely related or less, less closely related. Uh, yeah. And Yes, so in the book, they use uh, recipes for preprocessing for also dimensional data reduction, and you can use it without prediction part of, of modeling. So I won't in, go into that much detail because we already covered this in, in chapter six, mostly. Uh, so the, re the recipe defines the preprocessing you can use two functions which you wouldn't need if, if you use uh, recipes in workflows. So the prep function uh, 
calculate statistics based on the training set and also applies uh, the preprocessing steps to, to the training data. This saves the necessary uh, uh, like uh, partial results so that you can easily apply the, the recipe steps based on the training data for new data. So for, so for example, when you scale or normalize the data, you calculate the center and the standard deviation from the training data and then apply that to the new data or test data and you won't normalize it separately. And the same goes for uh, principal component analysis that you identify the major components and you will use the same components for new data and you won't calculate the relevant components again there. So there are not, not all steps, but, but some of the steps uh, require saving, saving some statistics based on the training data. And then the bake function is used to apply the preprocessing to the to to en, to, en, to any to to any new data. Uh, uh, yeah, so some of these preprocessing steps can be relatively expensive in terms of calculation time. So by default, the prep function will save the result of the preprocessing steps for the training data in its in, in the in the object. But if, if the data is bigger, uh, then you might not want to, want to keep it in memory. And also it's it's optimized in a way that if you modify a, a recipe and you and you add new steps, then it will only recalculate the new steps when you prep the recipe again. So it's it's quite nice. Uh, I guess it's it's relevant when you have like many steps or bigger data or more more complex. So so there are some simple steps where it's not not that important to have these have these optimizations. So yeah, so basically they for for this beans data set. Uh, they recommend some some normalization steps because the distributions are are far from normal before before I mean, any, any, any dimensional reduction happens. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the the retain argument is about keeping the prepped training data and. Yeah, so here's an example that, uh, yeah, so, sorry. So we have this, this, this recipe with these normalization steps. And if you prep and then uh, here you bake, bake it on, on the validation set, then you can you can see uh, like you have have the data and then you can plot or or see it any way that that you want so here you can so using these functions you can you can you can analyze the preprocessing steps used in recipes which are otherwise hidden when you use a whole whole workflow for a prediction task Yeah, so so I pass it to to Federica and and she will uh, detail the the actual dimensional introduction techniques. Okay, let's start from the other from the 
uh, dimension reduction techniques and um, so uh, here we see that basically what uh, the uh, book does is uh, uh, applying um, four uh, techniques which are principal component analysis um, the PLS so the partial least square uh, the ICA which is the independent component analysis and then the UMAP which is the um, the last one uh, and it's basically a uniform manifold approximation and projection. So these four techniques, uh, um, as said already, so in the other video, in the other court and everything, are to make basically the data uh, more manageable and to have, so for this reason, have uh, uh, less data and uh, but uh, at the same time uh, be able to understand the pattern so understand what the uh, and how uh, the predictors are correlated and in what way within each other uh, the, the first uh, technique, uh, the PCA, is the most important one, basically the, 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 the most, and even the most common one. This is because it is an um, unsupervised technique. And this uh, means that uh, we just take the data as they were numbers in a matrix. And then we see how these numbers are uh, correlated within each other. So maybe accounting uh, for variance and then consider the correlation. So what I want to do, uh, seeing the other cohort and everything, is try to understand what, what is principal component, what actually does, uh, as well as the partial least square. Um, basically, the, um, as I said, we want to uh, understand how our data is composed. Okay, as seen, we are talking about beans, and this is uh, these are our data. Uh, but mm, what we um, Mm, obviously we need to think about the kind of data okay because uh, principal component and partial least square can give you a nice visualization of the composition of data but it's mm, always important for you to have a, a little of expertise about uh, the argument of your data so you can uh, interpret the the result better. Um, I've heard uh, something today which was very related to, to this thing uh, and uh, it is like I can apply a model or a, ten, a technique into a model which I not understand the maths on but I hardly or I shouldn't absolutely um, disclose or um, conclude with what the result of these models are because uh, for doing this I need to understand the math inside the technique so for this reason I have done statistics so uh, I've done these things very thoroughly uh, at school with starting from the, 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 the ancient times from the very beginning. So now it takes time to go inside the thing. But 
what I want to revisit here is just like a sort of layer to underst of understanding of the thing. Uh, basically, what principal component does is uh, taking your data without the outcome. So consider just the predictors. Um, having said that the data have been tidied up very uh, clearly for being used for principal component analysis. So that means they are correlated, they are normalized, they are uh, scaled and everything. What principal component does is breaking up your number, your matrix of numbers in a certain number of components. And you uh, in, in, the, in the book uh, has chosen four components and what principal component does is I take my, my block of numbers and uh, I consider I have four components so I literally divide my block of numbers by four but so I have I know for example I have hundred uh, rows so I want like 20 rows for each component I should have something like that so um, but then how how can I choose how, what is the way I can choose this these four blocks okay the way I choose them is accounting for variance for day variance and so I choose the highest level of, of, of variance and I put the first 20 with the highest levels of that variance in the first block. Then I have the remaining and I, I make the second block or component, the second component. Then I make the third and the fourth component. So this is the reason you, you have obviously say uh, why the highest variance, why the lowest variance, so there's many things to say, but now we just want to understand what is happening, basically. So let's say just accounting for variance. And then we want, uh, uh, so this is the reason for which these are divided. Okay, and you can literally see that they group within each other because they have something in common. Okay. Uh, this is the, the, the graph that has already been seen in the previous court uh, and has been made with this uh, function. Uh, the function, uh, I don't know if you want, I go through the function, but uh, basically applies the ggforce package and uh, the geom auto density function and then with facet matrix from the same package it's able to replicate uh, this pattern which is very very nice um, and here you can actually see what is happening basically the first component related to the second component, so this, um, this facet here shows you that uh, like the Bombay class of the beans are all on a side and they are correlated within each other and they are not correlated with the others. So they have something in common within each other. So for this reason they have they are able to stay aside aside from the others and this is obtained um, basically uh, highlighting some um, characteristics of the data okay mm, one more thing that the book says is um, I leave that for, for doubt. Uh, you can use learn tidy model package 
for uh, basically uh, use this function plot top loadings and this is mentioned in the book uh, I need to work around this thing because I, I couldn't uh, load the package but then uh, uh, since the, the previous court Julia Silje has uh, made a video I don't know if you have seen it uh, about these things so I've turned around the thing uh, using the, the information uh, found in the video so I've replicated uh, uh, the, the, the bar plot uh, that was in the book I'll show you uh, this plot here and the, the other one from uh, uh, partially square using the information from the video so basically the, the data uh, because why we, we want to do that that, those are uh, basically the bars uh, because here you see the dots no? it's a scattered plot uh, and everything and you see that they are divided but now we want to see uh, what is the difference between each other how much they are in terms of if I have all in the same scale, the same condition, everything, how they differ from the, each other in terms of quantities, frequencies. So for, for doing this, we use bars, uh, so a bar plot. And uh, from the training set, um, we do um, uh, the step the principal components, then prep it, then tidy. If, if you have any um, questions, you just ask. And then we filter the result for the first um, four components. Then we group by component and we take the first five rows, which they have um, by absolute value okay we do not consider because some of them are negative some of them are positive then ungroup and, and then we make the plot okay so instead um, with the result okay so instead of just applying the function from learning tidy models as in the book okay uh, plot top loadings we went inside the function which does all these things here okay um, and basically we are able to obtain uh, a bar plot with uh, the number of, of component as facet okay then we will see this compare to partial lead square to see the differences and then we go back to, to this. Basically, the, uh, the result of this, uh, uh, this plot is this. But we talk about this later uh, together with um, partial lead square. So now this is very interesting to me. This is a partial lead square. Now that we had uh, like an introduction about principal component analysis, we jump to partial least squares. Partial least squares basically is um, there is a do you know from where the function name comes? I have not heard about them loading cost before. Uh, as far as I understand, it plots top most contributing variables featured in each component exactly uh, basically it does a, a bar plot and uh, as I said you can find it maybe you are able to load the package you can find it uh, find it loading the uh, what is it uh, learn tidy models package uh, there is the, a link in the book 
uh, you just link to that, it leads you to a GitHub page, uh, and then you just follow the installation uh, procedure to have the, the thing. It basically, it does uh, uh, this thing here. Okay, so if you see the uh, this uh, there is a step PCA yeah, yeah, yeah. and then prep and then tidy filter uh, everything basically is done by the function. The, the, actually, the function the function does something more because the the um, the bars as you can see are ordered. Instead, I didn't uh, give much thought about it, uh, I'm sorry about it. Uh, instead, I've just uh, um, not ordered it. Okay, so they just this. So the function does something more. Uh, basically, uh, the, the, the second uh, technique is partially square, uh, and it is a supervised technique. Uh, I've spent some time looking at this technique uh, and basically you need to think about this as a second step of principal component analysis. Okay, so basically in principal component analysis you don't take consideration of the uh, outcome. So here you do the same thing principal component does, but then you consider your result against the outcome variable and basically then we see when you when we compare the, the result uh, um, that there are little differences but again it's very important that you understand the argument of your data so basically partial d square uh, i've found this nice article which i've put the uh, the link here and I can uh, even uh, add in, in, in the chat, which is very nice. Uh, basically, this, uh, this article um, illustrates all the passages uh, and even the, it's an ancient article, but very important, um, illustrates the algorithm for making uh, partial least square. And you have, uh, as you can see, the predictors uh, relate to the component in a way that uh, uh, we first choose what are the predictor to put in the uh, what are the part of the predictor to put in the first component, and then we reach the outcome to see if they are suitable and then we make other components and so it's an iterative uh, procedure um, basically partial square finds components that are simul simultaneously summarized variation of the predictors while being optimally correlated with the outcome so not only within each other but also within the outcome. Partial least square is developed as a um, remedy for outlined weak points in some regression methods. It's done in the uh, first time in the late 60s by Wald in the field of econometrics. It's a good alternative to more classical multiple linear regression and principal component regression methods because it's more robust. The model parameters do not change very much when new calibration samples are taken from the total population. Also use it when there are correlated predictors and a linear regression type solution is desired. It's a supervised technique and it will derive components while simultaneously considering the corresponding response. Basically strikes a compromise between the objective of the predictor space dimension reduction and the predictive relationship with the response. Basically, 
uh, you can consider it and it can apply it when you do classification instead of regressions, but you can consider it uh, as a classification model because it creates dumbing variables. Um, so the data uh, even uh, as the same as for principal component analysis need to be centered and scaled. As I said, you start from principal components and then you consider the um, outcome. So partially squared does not calculate the principal component at once. Okay, but considers the residuals. And you know that the residuals, you cannot take the residuals only if you take consideration of the outcome. So once calculated the residuals, it derives the coefficients for prediction, which are the independent variables, so the sensitivities. Basically here I have, uh, put some uh, formulas. This is a model, a regression model, multiple regression model. And this is the same model in uh, matrix. Okay, so you have B, X, and the, these are the beta, these are the predictors, and these are the um, residuals. Okay, what uh, uh, partially square does is a literative uh, um, procedure and uh, basically uses um, the important part of any regression is to you it is its use in predicting the dependent block from the independent block so basically you, you would say I have the predictor, okay? So I use the predictor. You are using the predictor, but uh, you're using uh, a bit later. So there are some uh, questions in the chat. Loading is the weight, exactly. Um, so the coefficient of learning combination variable okay so basically as we use the the, the outcome first thing is um, trying to calculate the the residuals because this is a way to, to to use the information and to correlate your data to, to the predictors to the outcomes basically you see the differences no you know that if I I can do this because this is y and this is my outcome and I say that my outcome in the model uh, that, um, that we are going to see later it's class okay so basically I uh, use uh, where is the recipe okay I use class in my model as the outcome and all the others are my predictors okay so basically um, I need to go a little faster but uh, mm, uh, what you do is that you have uh, your let's see in matrix okay matrix with you have uh, uh, the, the the column of variables which are your um, predictors and these are the class variable it, it is the class variable then the others are all the predictors and they are in the x matrix the beta are the sensitivities so uh, the slopes that you can derive and e is the, the residual, which is the difference between these two. Okay, so the step is to first consider the residuals as zero. So you do the difference between all these columns and your column. 
how in what way in the way that you consider first the initially this difference equals to zero so if this is zero this equals to this and you can derive the beta this way using your uh, outcome okay and this is like the first step Okay, then you find some residuals because you find differences. Replicate the step, replicate the step, replicate the step. While grouping by taking care of variances and correlations. So basically, it uses an iteration method. Calculate, not necessarily, this is my understanding. It, I should remember quite correctly. So, um, uh, I can like throw uh, roots for bias, but uh, I say that uh, this is my understanding of the thing. And uh, so you use an iteration method, calculating probabilities, normalizing the things, uh, and repeating the steps while comparing the results and making groups, the components. Here I have uh, put the algorithm found in the article. Um, it says some different letters because it starts from here, like calculate the X loadings and whatever, all the other things. And then you derive uh, this thing. I don't know if you want, we can go back and see this because it's very interesting. Uh, but then uh, uh, assuming that the um, computer does all the work for us, applying this algorithm, and um, that we know that we are uh, grouping by variance, uh, centered and uh, scaled data, uh, considering the correlation of this, all the predictors compa uh, in comparison with the um, outcome so the class data for in our case for the bean uh, data and um, so uh, there is the same plot for principal component analysis which is this one here for partially square so i have grid arranged the the, the two uh, and it cannot be seen clearly because it should be like bigger, larger and, and everything, but there are some things that you that, that can be uh, seen. Mm, basically, they, they are a different from the, the partially square, uh, a difference of principal component, group the, the things by class. Cioè, con considering that class is um, correlated with the result of the other, uh, it cannot be seen clearly. So let's say that uh, uh, this is the other, okay, and um, this is the other, this is passive square. Okay, you, sh you should be able to see that uh, this, the, the grouping is by class. So it's taking care of the class variable more than in, uh, in the previous plot. Okay, so you, you, you just need to look at it carefully and you see that there is some differences for this reason okay so then the book mentioned uh, mix omics package which is important uh, is not by cran or by github but by bioc manager uh, this is uh, uh, needed um, for uh, using some steps uh, because it's correlated with other packages so you need to to have it for for the other. so as the same as before 
this plot here, which imply the function as said as before, I've used the video from Julia Silge. So this bit here uh, is not by the function, but it's by the video. And then I've made a grid range of the two. Okay, so here you can see, you can see the differences. So now you have the two techniques com in, in comparison. And you see that, uh, for example, you have this, these are the first five lines with highest level of absolute uh, variance. And you see that, for example, the shape factor 2 is positive in principal component. Instead, in shape factor 2 is negative in partial d square. Why? There is some chat. Uh, the difference will be bigger if uh, there were some rubbish features uh, as well as with other. Uh, yes, uh, there, there will be differences if there were some other things uh, in the predict in the outcome. So basically, the, the, if the uh, poi is supervised and unsupervised and everything, the first two controls seem to, seems to be basically mirror. Yeah, but there are little differences. Um, not only that, because some lengths um, differ as well. Like, for example, the roundness here and the roundness here also to be mirrored. So one is false as the other is true. This is even more uh, impacting. Basically, this is why the class is considered not just a variable, so not just a, a column of numbers uh, in, inside a matrix and so numbers to uh, allocate uh, for some uh, following some directions but uh, this number uh, have a reason to be there and as you can see the shape factor for example is false so if you look at the uh, correlation thing uh, above you see that the shape 2 factor is not uh, here. So it's not very correlated uh, okay, with the, the most of the other variables. Um, it's here, it's correlated with itself, uh, with the other shape factor but not very much with area, perimeters, as they are within each other. So it's negative. So still. But it got inside the first five lines because in terms of numbers, this is my understanding, um, it basically uh, showing itself up but on a negative way so op hopefully i've uh, so be able to explain some uh, part of my understanding i think that i would be uh, not picked in the partially square at all but might be picked up exactly this is this is why in uh, um, principal component, this is positive and it's very impacting compared to the others. So now, that, so these are two uh, techniques that are used for um, linear models, uh, regression models, um, 
a linear regression. But uh, if we want to see, so if we have data which are not, that we, ju we, go, we jump to the third technique, which is uh, ICA, independent component analysis, but if we do not have uh, residuals, like behaving um, normally, so we, have, we are not uh, in presence of uh, Gaussianity, but we have no Gaussianity, which generally needs linearity. Uh, at this point, uh, we say that um, it's better if we use a technique for making groups uh, which considers the elements independent from each other. Because it, otherwise, uh, you may find uh, different results, so unexpected results. To do this, uh, I need to do this plot uh, and to use uh, this step. Also, even if it's from receipt, uh, I needed to load these two packages um, because I haven't used it before. So I needed to do this. And what uh, independent component analysis does, sorry about the note. Uh, okay, um, is doing the same thing but considering uh, the element independent. And the independency is um, arise when you have not correlation within the variable. This is not actually very correct, but you say that uh, be, uh, between each other, your, um, your predictors are not um, depending from each other. So basically the, the realization of one of those is not in any manner related to, realiz to the realization of the other. So, um, I haven't stopped much on uh, talking about uh, um, this, but um, the, the main thing is this. Then we go to the fourth, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the plot is different from the, uh, the, other two, the, the previous two techniques. And the more dividing groups uh, is in this corner, which is the component four compared to the component one. And you find it here as well. This is the same component one compared to uh, component four. There's many, many more things to say, but time very short. So uh, I say the things that are, are uh, more impacting in my understanding and um, so as you can see this first component related to the fourth so the the the, uh, the first one uh, shows the most uh, uh, dividing groups but in our case uh, our uh, data are not independent. So if you have a bin, you need to think about it. If you have a bin, they, they cannot be actually, so they basically have some shape, which is they are beans, they're not uh, something else. So they are the information, the area, the perimeter, and everything are some, somehow correlated. So they're not completely independent. So you cannot have a perimeter excessively large or vice versa, because otherwise it's not a B. So in our condition, this is not um, showing up uh, things properly. But uh, the fourth te technique, which is very nice as well, implies, which is uniform manifold approximation and projection. This fourth te technique implies very thorough knowledge of the data, because otherwise you do not understand 
a thing of what happened. And it's actually very powerful because it divides the group far away from each other. So you can see what are they. Can be supervised, unsupervised, uh, still not linear dimension reduction as uh, IGA and based on nearest neighbors, graph networks, used for classification problems such as clusters, inside clusters, and that very, it is very sensitive to other parameters. I'm not leaving much space for discussion. It's, uh, you're already over, uh, so it's seven o'clock. But uh, so you do the, um, the two, the formulation I said uh, before, this is the function at the beginning of the, the, the section. Uh, you're just changing step you map with the embed uh, package. One, the super unsupervised doesn't use the outcome, the supervised use the outcome. And then you have a comparison of the result, and you see that uh, they are quite different. And you need to spend some thoughts about it. But now we go forward and see the model. So a model is uh, a relationship, no? This is all uh, we have said before. Now what the book does is comparing uh, five uh, models. So this chapter, chapter was to, to see the techniques for uh, making components, so reducing dim dimensionalities. So we see that uh, applying, for example, these five uh, uh, models, we make a receipt. Um, and then, uh, um, so basically, sorry, not easy. we make the five models. We uh, first step is to build a parsnip model object for the five models, um, as we know how to do it. And then uh, make a receipt with class as outcome. Uh, zero variance step normalizing uh, this um, this function here from best normalize uh, um, package uh, basically put all the things uh, as they were standardized it standardized the data basically then uh, there is a fourth step step normalize which uh, this is to rescale the variable, more similar to a normal distribution. And this is normalized numeric data to have a standard deviation of one. This is standardized. And this is to rescale to make it more normal distributed. Okay. So we have uh, the two, we make two recipe with the two steps, one with partial least square and one with UMAP. And we will put this inside the workflow. So the, uh, the workflow is made of a preprocessing part and the models uh, argument. The preprocessing part, there, is, there are the two recipe with the two different steps and the models with the five models. Then the workflow map uh, considers 10 grids. The resample, which has been made, uh, okay, we know about the resamples. Uh, and the as a metric set, uh, as chosen uh, the ROC uh, area under the curve metric. So, okay, okay, so basically uh, 
I have run the model and then I suggest you to uh, write a RDS file to save your result once, once you did it because uh, so you save time next time and then you save it and read it back uh, this is the inside uh, of the workflow basically as you see there are some uh, uh, basic partially square and you map result uh, and then uh, there is a bit of wrangling thing ab around uh, the result to select best uh, uh, and everything this map chart function as a method to uh, basically simplify uh, the result to see it better in a way that you can see it um, and you can see it here that you have uh, um, this is a filtering things for seeing just rank, mean, model and method and then finally uh, give us uh, out a visualization about how uh, this five model behaves compared to the three condition applied basic, partially square and new map as you can see that uh, uh, here we have uh, this cream regularized model with partially square which is the highest level and uh, the multiple uh, the MPL model with still partially square the most uh, the second most highest level and so you can have an idea of what is happening and then decide what is the best thing for you. Uh, this is the last bit of the, the chapter. Uh, extract the workflow with the partially square. And finalize uh, the workflow to collect the metric and uh, it's found a very nice estimate so i stop sharing <laughs> thank you very much for the detailed presentation that you went, went okay, I, I wanted to uh, to be just for myself and say the thing hopefully i pass some understanding yep. Okay, so, so thank you very much.